New Testament reading for uh, this, the second Sunday in Ordinary Time, comes from Paul's letter to the Corinthians in the fourth chapter. Uh, I'll be reading some selected verses from that chapter. So, listen to and for God's word for you this morning. We have this treasure in clay jars so that it may be clear that this extraordinary power belongs to God and does not come from us. For while we live, we are always being given up to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus may be made visible in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. But just as we have the same spirit of faith that is in accordance with Scripture, I believe and so I spoke, we also believe and so we speak, because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and will bring us into his presence. Yes, everything is for your sake. That is Paul speaking to a church. Everything is for your sake, Paul the pastor. So that grace, as it extends to more and more people, may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. So we do not lose heart. Even though our outer nature is wasting away, our inner nature is being renewed day by day. For this slight momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all measure because we look not at what can be seen but at what cannot be seen for what can be seen is temporary but what cannot be seen is eternal for we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed we have a building from God a house not made with hands that is eternal in the heavens. This is the word of God for the people of God. In the church calendar, as of last week, we have entered into the season that we call ordinary time. Now, if you're not familiar with the movements of the church calendar, you might think of these three movements in such a manner. First is that the, the year begins in the season of light. And what season do we begin in the church calendar with? Advent. advent. Okay, you all passed the test. So the season of light is Advent, Christmas, and Epiphany. God's light breaking into the world. The season of life, there's going to be three L's here. That was three. <laughs> the season of life is Lent and Easter. All right? And the season of love is ordinary time. Now, if you're like me, when you first hear that word ordinary time, you're like, wow, that's kind of like a bummer. Like, so ordinary. And the season we are called, in this season of ordinary time, we're called to live in the power and the love and the joy of the Holy Spirit that was poured out on Pentecost at the end of the season of life upon the church and work in the world, in our work, in our play, in our rest, in our families, in our neighborhoods, and with our neighbors. So in the context of the church year, the term ordinary does not mean usual or average. It means not seasonal. In ordinary time, the church celebrates the mystery of Christ, not in any major feast days, Christmas and Easter being the biggest, but in all aspects of life, helping us to discover how to live out our Christian faith in every aspect of our daily life. The season of ordinary time reminds us that all time is always extraordinary. What we may deem ordinary, God has made extraordinary by divine grace and the Spirit's abiding presence with us always and in all things. So ordinary time, which is the longest season in the church calendar, is about becoming awake, becoming aware of the ever near and abiding presence of God in our routine and normal life, our sleeping and our eating, our going to work, our walking around life. 
It's about learning to consciously live in the presence of God amidst changing diapers and doing laundry and dusting and filling out reports at your job that you don't want to fill out, about packing lunches, about driving to work and grocery shopping, about paying bills and responding to emails and then more emails and then a few more emails, (laughs) weeding your garden, studying for tests, Sorry for those of you who are, you know, you're on summer vacation. Washing dishes, planning and cooking meals, working extra hours at work that you didn't sign up for, talking to your neighbor who annoys you, filling out some more paperwork, vacuuming, committee meetings, and then doing some more laundry. God is present in all. Amen? Amen. Mother Teresa was perhaps one of the greatest examples of this ordinary kinds of love, in my opinion. She never set out to win the Nobel Peace Prize. She never set out to have her order the missionaries of charity operate 600 centers in 120 countries. She never set out to be beatified by the Pope. She simply set out to love the sick, the needy, and the humility. As she described her own self, I am simply a pencil in the hand of God. And yet, listen to her words of exhortation to us this morning. Do not think that love, in order to be genuine, has to be extraordinary. We must love those who are nearest to us in our own family. Above all, love has to start there. I want you to be the good news around you. I want you to be concerned about your next door neighbor. Do not pursue spectacular deeds. In the works we have to do, it does not matter how small or humble it may be. Make it Christ's love in action wherever you are. What matters the most is the gift of yourself and the degree of love you put into your own actions. So simple and yet so hard. This is what I hear in the Apostle Paul's words to this church that he loved in Corinth. Paul lived a life also of cruciform love, giving himself away, as we just sang, on behalf of God and others in the world. In this short section of his letter to the church in Corinth, he's expressing his deep, deep love for the church, and he says to them, we are always being given up to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus may be made visible in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. We know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and will bring us with you into his presence. Yes, everything, says Paul, is for your sake. The pouring out of Paul's love for the church. So that grace, as it extends to more and more people, may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Paul, like Jesus himself, says, I am called to give my life away. I am called to pour out my life, being given up for death. And yes, in Paul's case, maybe that was a literal death. But he did it in small, simple, ordinary acts of love that the vast majority of the New Testament do not record, knowing that new life will come in those he served Through Jesus, everything is for your sake, is what he said. Everything I do, I do for you. It's a song in there somewhere. And why? Why would he do this? He says, so that grace might extend to more and more people. And as grace extends to more and more people, more and more people give thanks and praise to God. In the words of Tom Wright, a New Testament scholar, he says it this way, the more people that are praising God, the more the world is taking the shape it was meant to have, and the more God's power goes out to save and heal where those generous blessings are still needed in this world. Friends, this is what it looks like to live into ordinary time, the season of love. 
Out of love, we live for the sake of others. As we do so, grace upon grace gets poured out upon others. And bit by bit, through our everyday ordinary living, the world gets filled up with thanksgiving and gratitude and praise and healing and wholeness spills out into every nook and cranny of this world, particularly where you work and live and abide. The reality of this goodness and grace and glory happening in small and simple and ordinary, ordinary ways is what call, Paul causes Paul to say, don't lose heart because this work is self-sacrificial. Giving and service is difficult and hard and it rubs against the grain of our natural inclinations to just take care of ourselves. And so we don't lose heart. In July, it will have been four years that I've been working here at East Liberty Presbyterian Church. And in those four years, we have faced many challenges, difficulties, and changes. Perhaps you've noticed some of these challenges and difficulties <laughs> and changes. Why are you laughing? Perhaps you identify with this phrase as you think about our community, our church together, that Paul says, our outer nature is wasting away and our earthly tent seems to be being destroyed. And I'll be honest with you, I too have had experienced, experienced moments and seasons of wondering what is happening here at East Liberty Presbyterian Church and I have asked God many times, why did you bring me here? I remember sitting with Randy and Heather in my pre-interview interview and talking about leading to Zay and doing spiritual direction for people in the church and leading retreats. And I said, that sounds wonderful. And while that has been wonderful, there have been lots of other things that have happened. <laughs> to begin with, I started during the middle of a pandemic. And our country was going through a racial reckoning. And some of our own church realities, we were going through some of our, our own racial reckoning. And I've spent many hours asking God why to bring me here in the midst of a, trend, a pastoral transition, organizational and staffing changes, restructuring of a church, trying to figure out what it means to be the cathedral of hope in a post-pandemic reality of church, not just here in this local congregation, but in churches across the United States of America. What does church participation look like on the other side of a pandemic? Now, let me be clear, I am not complaining. But I'm being honest with you about my, some of my own soul searching and wondering with God. Perhaps you have done those, asked those questions and wondered with God as well. And amid all the changes and challenges, and to use Paul's phrase, these momentary afflictions, the truth of the matter is like Paul, I have not lost heart. For I know that my and your inner nature are being renewed day by day. I actually believe that. And this slight and momentary affliction, this time of transition, this pivoting space that we're in as a church and that the larger church in, in North America is in, is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory that is beyond all measure. For we know that if this earthly tent, and I think Paul's speaking about the human body here, but we might apply that to this earthly tent, that we sit in the midst of, if this earthly tent is destroyed, which I don't think it is, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands that is an eternal in the heavens. Amen? Amen? And in fact, I do see grace extending more and more people to more and more people and increasing thanksgiving and gratitude and the glory of God right here in our midst. So I want to try something with you. Try this phrase on. We do not lose heart. One, two, three. We do not lose heart. Okay, so I've written a litany. And I'm going to ask you when I pause to say we do not lose heart. Tell you what I see, and I've probably not seen everything, right? But this is what I see. 
I see people stepping up into formal and informal spaces of service and leadership throughout the church and beyond these walls. I see people finding rest and restoration for their weary souls in and through regular practices of prayer and contemplation and meditation and retreats and yoga. I see new people every week entering our doors and being served and empowered through the chapel market. As Gerald always says, the chapel market is booming. I see the unchurched and dechurched young adults sitting in meditation every Tuesday with John Benedict for an hour in our chapel. I do not lose heart. Don't lose heart because there's a lot of good news here. I see a staff team once again supporting and encouraging one another, laughing and praying together and chipping in on work together regardless of whether it's on our job description. I see an elders in session that is focused and communicating in a healthy manner, leaning into hard topics and seeking to listen to the spirit about the shape of East Liberty Presbyterian Church right now and into the next chapter. You losing heart? I see ELPC's flagship ministry to our LGBTQIA plus growing and deepening with record participation in pride last week. We have had a record number of infant baptisms in the last year amid celebrating Miss Kay Schistler's 60 years of teaching kids. I see a pastoral nominating committee that has tirelessly and prayerfully listened to you, to one another, and is now listening to dozens of pastoral candidates. You sure? I see Casas San Jose and Hope Academy partnering to teach performing arts lessons to children who speak Spanish as their first language. I see conversations afoot among many of our committees that are wrestling with where God is leading and giving them energy and fruit to discern what God is leading them to let go of and be pruned back. I see and hear amazing music every Sunday with voices and instruments, and in my case, a joyful noise unto the Lord every Sunday with a 10-year partnership with Brass Roots. We're not done yet. I see church seeking to pursue racial justice and making acts of repair through the lives of African-American scholarships in our neighborhood schools. I see remarkable confirmed youth, Kevin speaking wisely, winsomely, and prophetically about their personal faith journeys and how they want ELPC to continue to be a place of radical hospitality. There's three more. Hang in there. I see people stepping up and using all kinds of their gifts and passions and voices to teach, guide, lead, instruct, and inspire all of us in a variety of manners and settings. I see members of the church being less staff dependent and coming to help and clean and paint and maintain and sustain this beautiful physical building that we have. And finally, and I know I haven't said everything, I see our deacons striving to figure out how to care for some of our older and homebound members by visiting, praying, and serving them communion. Friends, I see grace extending to more and more people and it's increasing thanksgiving to the glory of God so please as one of your pastors do not lose heart and I wonder as we went through that little playful litany this morning what you see what you hear Perhaps there was even a stirring of invitation for you to give your life away, to serve, to teach, to love, to care. Friends, let us not go weary in doing what is right, for we will reap at harvest time if we do not give up. So then, whenever we have opportunity, let us work for the good of all, and especially those right here within the family of faith. So that grace, as it extends to more and more people, may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. In the name of God the Creator, God the Redeemer, and God the Sustainer, may it be so. Amen. Amen.